أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم ولعن حدوهم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters May Allah bless you and accept all of your a'mal and your fast بحقي محمد وآل محمد And since this is the second day of us celebrating the birth of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba alayhi salam I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba to give us the intercession of Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam on the day of judgment to make us from those who walk on the footsteps of Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam and to make us from those who emulate Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam in our lives بحقي محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد Yesterday, my brothers and sisters, we took a little break from the um, series that we were uh, doing under the, uh, under the title Holistic Islam. And we began speaking a little bit about Imam Al-Hasan, trying to bask in the glory of Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam, trying to take from his qualities by learning about his life. By Hassan alayhi salam. And we said the premise of such a lecture is not merely just for information. It's not merely informative. Rather, rather, the meaning, the goal behind such lectures when we discuss the value and the virtue of these individuals is obviously to learn from them, yes. But also to know them, for they are the door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you know Ahlul Bayt, you know Allah ultimately. When you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to know yourself. The one who knows himself knows his Lord. And if you know yourself, and if I know myself as a humble servant as I am, I'm going to better myself. I'm going to move forward progress practically just the same. And so you find those that are engrossed in the lives of Ahlul Bayt, you can see it on a practical level, how they emulate them, or, or just their akhlaq, their morals, their ethics, and their values mirror them alayhim salam because they themselves subconsciously begin to mirror ahl al-bayt alayhim salam Allah. And so we began my brothers and sisters and we started to speak about the value of Imam al-Hasan. And we said if any human being has value, if any human being carries value, it's from two sources or it comes from in two different ways. The first way is external. Second way is internal. What do we mean by external and internal? We said external value, where they get their value from the external world, from something other than themselves, is by someone else or something else giving them or showing them, pointing to the value that they had. Someone of value, respecting this individual, honoring this individual. And we said the likes of this person was Rasulullah when it came to Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was that middle ground, was that scale, was the system of values for the people. And so if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave a reason why he valued this person, did not give a reason why he valued this individual, as long as he showed value and love to a said person, this person was going to be valued in the eyes of the Muslimin. And so you found that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on many key occasions, seemingly randomly, would go to Imam al-Hasan, would go to Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, present them to the people and say, I love them. And so, if I love them, you must love them. And God loves the one who loves them. Even going as far as saying, even as going as far as saying, those who are not present, let them know of what I just said. Almost like the wahi. Almost like the revelation itself, where if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting with four or five people and a verse came down, he would not only say the verse and recite the verse for them to hear, but would expect the people that were present to tell those that were absent. When it came to the love of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salamullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do the same thing would do the same thing. And so you found that the people honored and respected Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, even the enemies themselves, even the enemies. 
In other occasions, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, ahl al bayt will tell you why Imam al Hassan alayhi salam had the value that he had. In a riwayah that we said yesterday, we said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam told the people, I value and I love this boy because of what he is going to do in the future. What is he going to do in the future, Ya Rasulullah? He is going to bring two groups of Muslims together. He is going to bring two conflicting sides together. He's going to make peace. And SubhanAllah, that's exactly what he did with Muawiyah. In another instance, we found that Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam was called Ayyuhal Alimu bit Ta'wil. O oh, you who knows the Ta'wil of the Quran. And we said the difference between Ta'wil and Tafsir is Ta'wil is going back to the first meaning, the, depth, the deepest meaning, not the superficial meaning, rather the meaning that's underneath the superficial meaning, the meaning that is not apparent for me and you, the meaning that we need the Imam alayhi salam to tell us of. And Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam was given that quality because, wallahu al-alim, this could be one of the reasons, one of the wisdoms, because the people would doubt in the decision-making of Imam al-Hasan in the future when he made peace with Muawiyah. And so there was a, there was a, um, there was a special attention given to his decision-making and that he knew what was behind the decision. He knew what was happening underneath what everyone was seeing superficially. So if everyone saw that Muawiyah should have been fought, Imam al-Hasan making the decision to make peace had to have been accepted because he knows what's underneath what everyone else sees. For he is alim bit ta'weed. He knows of the ta'weed. He knows of the hidden meanings. He knows of things what uh, he knows of the things that people don't see. He knows what's underneath the shell. And so we said, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam takes that value that is given to him, or or referred to him, referred to him by others by others, by other immaculate figures of Ahlul Bayt Today we're going to look at the second way, the second method by which you know the value of a human being or the value of another human being of a person shows himself, shows itself the value of Imam al-Hasan And we said the second means is internally. What do I mean by internally? Where the value of that person shows itself from the person himself. Where the person seeing Imam al Hassan alayhi salam does not have to have an external reference to know the value of Imam al Hassan, rather, the value of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam shows itself from himself. He is that source, he is that more or less the pointer, he is the one that is that is a more like that screen that shows the value of who he was. Alayhi salam Allah. And this, my brothers and sisters, also presents itself in two manners. Also presents itself in two manners. The first manner is that natural aura that Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam had. A natural aura. What do I mean by natural aura? Have you ever been in a room and somebody walks in the room or you've been in a hall, for example, and someone walks in the hall and all of a sudden everything stops and everyone turns to look at that person not because of what they're wearing, not because they're the man of the hour, not because they're a special, rich, famous human being. No, they're just a normal person. But there's just something about that individual that makes everyone turn, makes everyone look and, and notice that person. The aura that that person carries. And this has happened to me. One time we were in a hall. We were in a hall. And uh, it was pretty much in the middle of the middle of the banquet that we were at, all of a sudden this sheikh comes into the room and everything stops. Like it's as if everyone stopped eating, stopped what they were doing and they looked at that sheikh as he walked into the room and he sat down. And this sheikh was known to be very, very, very spiritual. Very spiritual. Had this very spiritual aura to him. And the reason why he came late was because he was praying Salat al-Maghrib in the mosque and he was doing his daily a'mal. And then after he got in his car and he came to the banquet while everyone else prayed at the banquet and went back to their seats. He chose to do the, the um, he chose to, to pray at the mosque. 
That's why he was late. But when he came in, everyone looked at him. Everyone saw him. Everyone noticed him. He had that aura to him. The first method is that natural aura that is given off. And second is by the actions of that person. For a human being is known by the actions. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Speak and you'll be known. For the human being is hidden underneath his tongue. Speak and you'll be known. For the human is hidden underneath his tongue. The actions of the human being. As for the first one, the aura, you found that Ahl al-Bayt had this natural aura to them. And it was a common thing that you saw with Ahl al-Bayt where the friend and the foe could not bear the magnificence of Ahl al-Bayt the reverence that they held. The reverence that they held. For example, you find many, many examples. Here's one example from Imam al Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. In the famous story of the poet of the, po- the poem of Al Farazda, where Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam was in Hajj. And also, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was in Hajj. For those who don't know, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was one of the Umayyad Khulafa that came after Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Yazid ibn Muawiyah's caliphate was for about three or four years, about three years. After him, there was a little time period, a small, very short time period for some of the other khulafat that we had. The likes of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, Marwan ibn, um, sorry, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, and the likes, they were from Bani Umayyah. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was a khalifa that lived at the time of Imam al Sajjad. And it is said, Hisham went to Hajj one year. And in Hajj, you know, it's very, very crowded. Hisham, being the Khalifa of the Muslimin, being the king, being the emperor, was trying to get to Al-Hajar Al-Aswad, the black stone, pretty much trying to get to the gap. He was fighting his way from between the people and the people would not let the Khalifa himself get to the black stone, the Khalifa. And by the way, this Hisham ibn Abdul Malik was not a nice guy. I mean, it's not like he was, a, he was a pious individual. He was known to be very ruthless. Very aggressive, violent individual, bloodthirsty. This man had no morals, no values whatsoever. If you thought Yazid ibn Muawiyah was bad, then look at Hisham ibn Abdul Malik and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and the list goes on. And they were known, and this is known in history. Jimmy. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, he quits. He said, I'm not going to get to the stone. Nobody's respecting me. Nobody has. Any, any, it's no, no one shows me any value. It seems that my value is only when I'm sitting on the chair. But when I'm an equal wearing the ihram with the person that, 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 that peasant in my emperor empire, I'm a nobody. And so nobody respects me. No one reveres me. They only revere me when I hold the sword. He goes back and it is said his men make for him a mimbar, make for him a place to sit so he can watch over the people. All of a sudden. The Rawaya says, a man walks to the crowd of people around the Kaaba. On him, he was wearing a cloak. His, fa- his face shined, and from him, you can smell the sweetest smell. They say his face was white, was shining. And between his eyebrows, on his forehead, he had a bruise from sujood. He walked through the crowd. When the crowd saw this man, they made way for him. They made way for him. And subhanAllah, subhanAllah, when I hear the story, it's as if I feel that Imam alayhi salam is walking and the people split like the Sea of Moses. This is how I imagine Imam alayhi salam walking through the people. They made way for him. He goes to Al-Hajar al-Aswad, he touches it. Who's watching? Hisham ibn Abdul. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik is watching. One of his men asked, like, who is this man? Hisham knows who this man is. They know. SubhanAllah, it's the Khulafa that knew them the most. He knew. But what did he say? He said, no, no, I don't know. He didn't want the people to know who this man was. He didn't want them to ask and know the name of this man. Because he feared him. SubhanAllah, they all feared him. All of the Khulafa feared Ahl al-Bayt, salam, even if Ahl al-Bayt salam, didn't hold the sword. He said, who is this man? 
Hisham said, I don't know. Who answers Al Farazdaq? Al Farazdaq, a famous poet. Al Farazdaq answers. And he says his famous lines of poetry describing the Imam. He says, Ya Sa'ili, Aina Halla al Judu al Karamu. Oh, you who asks me, where al Jud? Where generosity, where honor, magnificence has found its place. I have the answer for those who ask the question. This is the one who al Batha, either the earth or Mecca itself, knows his footsteps. The house knows him. The Kaaba knows him. Know him. Al-Halal, Al-Haram. Know him. The shrines know him. The holy places know him. This is the one who is the son. Of the best of servants. This is the pure. This is the flag. This is the purified. This is the righteous. And he keeps going describing the Imam. But the point. What was the point? When the people saw him. They made way. And by the way. Some of our ulama. Keep this in mind for Imam Zainal Abidin. So you can get context. Understand the context. Some of our ulama say that at the time of Imam Zain al-Abidin, those who actually believed in the imamate of Zain al-Abidin, I heard one of the prominent ulama say, he said, bin addu al -asabi'. You can count them on your fingers. Probably not more than 10. Those who actually believed in his imamate, maybe excluding his family members other than his family members, 10, maybe 10. He, he, the alim said they, they probably would not even be more than than the, the 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 fingers on your hands pretty much 10 so it's not like these people believed that he was the imam in other words it's not like these people understood him to be the imam of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet by his aura just his aura that's what acted like the staff of moses the imam was moses and his staff was the aura that he gave off and it's good to see jameen Another instance was with Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. By the way, the first riwayah is in Bihar al-Anwar. The second instance was narrated by a Shaykh al-Tabrasi. Happened to Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. What happened? What happened? Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Ashtar al-Alawi, he narrates. He narrates. He says, I was with my father at the door of al-Mutawakkil. The Mutawakkil al-Abbasi. I was young, he says. Between a group of people, some of them were from Banu Abu Talib, were from, sorry, the, the, they were from the lineage of Abi Talib. Some of them were Abbasis from the lineage of Al-Abbas, Amm nabi And those that were from the army, the soldiers, Jameen. As we were standing, Ja'a Abu Al-Hasan, Al-Hadi alayhi salam, Fatarajjal al-Nas, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, or sorry, Imam al Hadi alayhi salam, he comes, and when he came, all of those that were on horses came down from their horses. Jami, Jami. All of the people came down from, from their horses. Some of those that were there said, Why did they come down from their horses? Who is this guy? Who is this man? He's not the best of us. He's not the eldest one out of all of us. Who is this guy that everybody, when they saw him, they came down from their horses? Wallah, la tarajjalna lah. These people said, those that were asking between themselves, they said, if he comes back, we're not going to come down from our horses anymore. We're not going to come down from our horses for him. Who is this person? Faqala Abu Hashim al-Ja'fari. One of the men that was there, that was loyal to the Imam. He said, Wallah, la tarajjalna lahu. He says, by God, if you see him again, you're going to come down from your horses. By God. 
the Imam alayhi salam now comes back. He comes back again. Those same people see the Imam, they look at him, and they could not help but come down from their horses, saying, Wallah, ma malakna anfusana hatta tarajjalna. They came down from their horses. They asked them, Tayyip, what happened? Didn't you just say you're not going to come down from your horses? They said, when we saw him, we couldn't bear ourselves. We had to come down. We had to come down. The aura of magnificence that they held, alayhi wasalam. The aura of magnificence. Imam al-Hasan, alayhi salam, was known for this trait. The aura that he gave off. And that trait, my brothers and sisters, was one that he was singled out for. He was singled out for this trait. Just like his, his trait of knowing at ta'wil He was singled out. He was said, this is what Imam al-Hasan holds. He was more or less given that trait and it was written in the riwayah. When it comes to the aura of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, his magnificence, you find the same thing applies. Where the riwayah itself tells us that Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam was given this quality. By who? By Rasulullah. Look what the riwayah says. In Al-Khisal for Shaykh al-Saduq, it's narrated. بنت أبي رافع قالت أتت فاطمة بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم بابنيها الحسن والحسين عليهما السلام إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وحاب بن سيد فاطمة عليها السلام brought إمام الحسن and إمام الحسين to رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم in his on his deathbed so in the final days if you would of his life جميل فقالت يا رسول الله هذا هذان ابناك فورثهما شيئا she said to him يا رسول الله you're going to leave this world these two are your sons give them something as inheritance give them something as inheritance قال so رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم said to him said to her sorry أما الحسن فإن له هيبتي وسؤددي as for Al Hassan, I have given him my eminence, my magnificence, and my reverence. And as for Al Hussein, I have given him my generosity and courage. These qualities were given to them by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's not surprising when you see. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam walking to Hajj and the people walking in front of him like a flock. It's not surprising when you hear that Imam al Hassan, as he walked towards Hajj, everyone that was on his horse, all the people that were on their horses, would come down so that Imam al Hassan can walk past them. Even the likes of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas would come down from his horse and watch Imam al Hassan as he walked by out of respect. Who was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas? You know a guy named by the name of Umar ibn Sa'd? We all know that person, right? Umar ibn Sa'd, the killer of Imam al Hussein, the commander of the army, huh? The one who gave the command for Shibr ibn al Jawshan to do what he did to Abu Abdullah. He was the son of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. This man. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was the father of Umar ibn Sa'ad, came down from his horse when he saw Imam al-Hasan. It's not surprising when you hear that Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam would go out in front of his door and sit down. And when he sat down, no one would dare pass in front of him. The street would be shut down. Essentially, essentially the street would shut down. The light wouldn't turn green. It would stay red. And Imam al Hassan lived in Medina. And Medina was known. Medina was known as the central city. When the deserts, when the people of the deserts, the Bedouins, would not find food, would not find water, if there was famine, if there was drought, people would come to Medina. And there's a riwayah that, that said this. There's a riwayah that says this. People would come to Medina. Yeah, and Medina was a thriving city full of people. If Al Hassan came and sat in front of his, foot, his doorstep, they would not pass in front of him. The street would be closed. 
This is Al Hassan alayhi salam. This is the aura that Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam gave off. Not just this, not just this. Marwan ibn Al Hakam. Marwan ibn Al Hakam was also one of those close, he was very close to Muawiyah, was very close to the enemies of Al Bayt alayhi salam. And he was known to have the animosity towards them. Or he was he was known to work against them at the very least or hurt them. Marwan ibn al Hakam, when Imam al Hassan alayhi salam was killed, and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, along with other members of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam al Abbas, they were carrying the coffin of Imam al Hassan. Who came and tried to carry the coffin with them? Marwan ibn al Hakam. Marwan ibn al Hakam tried to carry it. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam turns to him and he says, In his life you hurt him. And after his death, you want to carry his, his coffin? How does that work? Marwan ibn al-Hakam says, how can I not do this for the man whose clemency, forgiveness, kindness was equal to that of the mountains? His enemies, his enemies even respected him. The aura that Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam had, the aura that he gave off it's not surprising when Imam al Hassan alayhi salam stood up in front of the people after the death of his father. He stood up and he said to them, Ayyuhan nas, O people, man arafani faqad arafani, wa man lam yarifni faan al Hassan ibn Ali. O people, who, whoever knows me knows me. Whoever doesn't know me, I am al Hassan ibn Ali. And he begins to list his virtues, who he is, who his forefathers are, what qualities they held, who he is to them. He begins to list them. And who was there? Who was there? Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we might read these riwayat and may not understand the context of these riwayat and when these riwayat were said. And by the way, just in brackets, because it really helps us here. I want you, I want us to start doing something and I advise and I'm nobody to advise, but our teachers advise us and we more or less pass the message. I advise my brothers and sisters, anybody that reads the riwayah, take into account the listener, take into account the one the Imam is speaking to, not just the words of the Imam. I can say something now, but you can cut it and take it out of context. Yes. Like you may listen to an entire lecture, but depending on who I'm speaking to, depending on who I'm speaking to, you might understand my words differently. If I was speaking to children, then the goal behind this very lecture is very, very different. Very, very different than if the audience was, for example, elders of the community. By you knowing who the target audience is, you can give context, even more context, to the clear words someone is, someone is saying. My words are clear. And what I'm doing is clear. What I'm talking about is clear. The message is clear, but what gives more context to the words is the audience, who the imam is speaking to. Read the riwayat with that, with that understanding and with that tone, with that lens. You'll find that you can understand more things about the riwayat when you read them in this way. Here, let's understand who the imam is speaking to. Where is imam is speaking to the people at the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Jamil. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the Khalifa for about five years, yes? Like in that five years, Imam, Imam Ali alayhi salam fought three civil wars. Sufi, Nahrawan, and Al-Jamal, Jamil. Those three wars, what did they cause? They caused the Muslims to split into groups, factions, and many Muslims lost their lives because of these three civil wars. Obviously, not Amir al muhmin is not at fault. His opponents are at fault. Nonetheless, Civil war, what does it do? It devastates. It devastates. Any country that's had civil war feels the effect of that civil war for tens of years, for decades. Go to Lebanon today. Go to Iraq today. Right? Go to different countries in the world that had had civil war. Some of the African countries, Somalia, example, Sudan. Some of these other war countries that have had civil wars. Let's see what's going on with them today. Even until today. Although their wars happened maybe decades ago, decades ago in Lebanon, oh my God, even until today, there are ruins from the civil war in Lebanon. And the civil war happened maybe 30, 40 years ago. Yes, 30 years or so ago, even more. But still till today, we feel the effects. 
civil war rips apart civilization. It's like, imagine having three civil wars in five years. What will happen to the people? Every single person is his own political party. Every person, every person has their own political view. You cannot get the people to come to an agreement on what to eat. Forget politics. This is what Imam Ahad, this is what Ali ibn Abi Talib used to eat, therefore I'm not going to eat it. This is what Ali ibn Abi Talib used to like, therefore I'm going to eat it. On what they ate, they probably couldn't even sit and agree. When Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam declared himself as the Khalifa of the Muslimin, it is said the people, all of the people that were there, maybe except a few, 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 very few, all of them accepted al-Hassan alayhi salam. The companions of Rasulullah that were still present accepted Imam al Hassan. Accepted. Some of them may not have even fought with Amir al Mu'mineen yet when it came to Imam al Hassan, they accepted him. And it is said, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam would have waves of people coming in and pledging allegiance to him. Waves. Yani the revolution of Imam al Hassan was very strong when it came to the manpower behind it. Obviously, those people, because of the civil war, they didn't have a strong aqidah, so they were easily bought off by Muawiyah. But in the beginning, they were all looking at us. He had that aura. Jamil, the aura of Imam al-Hassan, the magnificence, the reverence of Imam al-Hassan. Hey, what about his characteristics? If I begin... Speak of the characteristics of Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. I won't be able, I won't be able to finish. But I can say this. I can say this. Sheikh Baqa Sharif Al Qarashi in his book, he gives a quote of some sociologists when they speak of the leader of human beings and what human beings are naturally inclined to. Look what he says. Look what he says. Look at this quote. And we're going to explain it and then apply it to Imam al-Hassan and see how Imam al-Hassan fits into it. And obviously, right now we're talking about the, the value of Imam al-Hassan when it comes to the characteristics that he held. He says, quoting some sociologists, he says, nations contend for superiority during the condition of nomadism through strength. In other words, when human beings are just nomads, when they're nomads, they look for superiority they look for superiority. And superiority to them equals strength. Therefore, the leader that they follow is the strongest of the pact. The strongest of the pact. And this is why back then, back then in the nomad way of life, men were usually, usually the leaders. Men were usually the leaders. Because back then, a man was the one that was constantly going out to hunt. A man was the one that was going through vigorous physical activities. And so therefore, naturally, physically, he was the strongest. Jemmy. If they advance, he keeps going. They contend for superiority through science. When they advanced as a species, as a species, human beings left strength aside. And they went to the knowledgeable one. A person could be skinny, skinny. But if he knows how to make a catapult, then I really don't care how much pounds you can lift. A big rock launched from a catapult is going to destroy you. Knowledge and science beca beca became the equivalent of superiority in the eyes of the people. And so they went to the philosophers, for example. They went to the scholars for guidance and leadership. But then if they reach an objective progress, they contend for superiority through noble moral traits. When they advance even more, when they advance even more and knowledge becomes widespread, what distinguishes a good leader from a bad leader? It's not the knowledge. It's how they use it. Their moral traits. Their moral traits. That's what distinguishes this person from his partner. Therefore, Good manners are the utmost of what man reaches in his highness, perfection and education. When it comes to the leader, 
when it comes to the person of value, when it comes to what human beings naturally give value to the most, it's their morals, their moral traits. We want to know of the moral traits of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. Many, many, many narrations. The narration of the Syrian man that went to Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam when he knew it was Imam al-Hassan, he swore at Imam al-Hassan, belittled Imam al-Hassan or tried to, tried to belittle Imam al-Hassan. After Imam al-Hassan let him finish, and after the man stopped speaking, the Imam alayhi salam looked at him, he said, oh man, it looks like you're not from these parts, you're not from Medina. I haven't seen you before. Maybe I can invite you into my home. Maybe I can give you food if you're hungry. Maybe I can help you. Maybe if you have a desire, I can give you whatever, whatever it is that you need. Obviously, I'm giving a summary of the narration. Some of it for myself even because <laughs> I'm fasting. The moral. Maybe I can help you. Maybe I can give you food. Maybe we can provide something for you. The man looks at the imam. Before, before he thought Imam al-Hassan was a man that was standing against the Khalifa of his time, a kafir, a man that didn't know God, a man who had no morals, no values, a man, a man who was treacherous, a weak man. Now, this very same al-Hassan is offering me food, offering me a place to stay, offering me money, offering me whatever it is that I need after I swore at him. You know how he answers Imam al-Hassan? He says, truly God knows where to put his message. There's a realization that what he was fed before was lies. And Muawiyah was very, very, very keen, very keen on brainwashing his people. Very keen to the point where when Imam Ali salam was killed in Kufa and news reached Sham, Syria, you know what the people said? Ali used to pray. He was killed while praying. He used to even pray this man. They didn't know that Ali was walking, talking Salat. They didn't know that Ali was walking, talking Quran. They didn't know. They thought he was a clown. Same with Imam al-Hassan. He says, God knows where he puts his message. Similar, when it comes to the generosity of Imam al-Hassan, Hadith wala harash. Begin speaking and don't stop. He was known as Kareem Ahl al-Bayt. To be from Ahl al-Bayt is an honor. To be known as the generous one from amongst them. To be of the scholars, for example, is an honor. To be Sayyid Khu'i of your time is an honor. Above all honor. To be of the maraji' of our maraji' is an honor. But to be the Sayyid Khu'i of your time, that is something that no other human being can get to. That's an honor above every other type of honor. He was known as the generous of Ahlul Bayt. And the generosity of Imam al Hassan, if you begin, you can't end. You won't be able to end. Where Imam al Hassan alayhi salam gives the woman, gives the woman a thousand sheep, a thousand dinar, because one day he went to her after he was coming back from Hajj with his companions and with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and I think one other companion. When they went to this woman, they asked her for some food, for something to drink. She gave them the only animal she had. When he saw her again in Medina, he gave her a thousand sheep and a thousand dinar and told her to go to Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein did the same. Tell her to go to Jafar ibn Ab Abdullah, I believe it was, or one of the other companions. He did the same. This was Imam al Hassan. Imam al Hassan, who was known. That any man, any person, any beg beggar that would ask him, he would never say no out of shame, out of shame of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That every time we turn to God, God, we don't want him to say no. In that very same respect, he applied that and said, if somebody comes and asks me, I'm going to say no. But when I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I always want him to say yes. Where's the fairness in that? Imam al Hassan. That if Muawiyah was asked a question by the king of the Romans, he would send a spy to Medina to ask that very same question to Imam al-Hassan. So that spy can get up and go, take that message back to Muawiyah. So Muawiyah can look like the man that knows it all. 
But who did he go back to? Even, even Muawiyah. Even Muawiyah went back to Imam Hussein. The Khulafa going to Amir al muminin is one thing. Muawiyah, your killer, goes back to you when he doesn't have the answer. Yes. And more than this, you want to know the moral traits of Imam al Hassan? The peace treaty with Muawiyah, where Imam al Hassan had, had the option of fighting but risk losing everything or making peace. And having the people look at him as a weak and as a coward. He put his arrogance aside. Well, Ayyad Billah, he had no arrogance. A man like me would have to put his arrogance aside and make that decision. And our words, what we see, we say, Al Hassan had to put his arrogance aside. Like there was no arrogance there. But for me and you to understand so we can connect, we say, arrogance on that day had to be put aside. Just to put that, put that arrogance aside. How much control does a person have? What kind of moral compass does this individual have to have to put everything aside so that he can keep this message going? That's what makes Al Hassan ibn Ali the best leader. And I say this with confidence the best leader to ever lead the Muslimin. The best leader. And by the way, my brothers and sisters, let's spread that message. Yes, let's spread that message. Al Hassan being the best leader to ever lead the Muslim. Put it as a status, put it as an, a Facebook page or Facebook post, as an Instagram picture. Spread that. Spread that statement. Al Hassan, the best leader of the Muslim. Yes, rightfully so. Rightfully so. Spread that message. Give him that place, my brothers and sisters, in the eyes of the Muslim. It's about time that all of the Muslims know Imam al Hassan for who he truly was and stop looking at him as a coward and as weak. For if a human being was to use his mind and save his fellow human beings but be called weak, then I myself am honored to be of the weak ones. And we are all honored. And we would love to be of the weak ones if it means saving the muslimin and islam itself by making that decision and that decision is seen as weakness then i would bow down to weakness in itself and all of us for that perceived weakness is the embodiment of strength and that is what al-hasan alayhi salam is ويرحمنا إنه نعم المولى ونعم النصير وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين